professor of political economy at the University of Applied Science, Zwickau, Germany. He is a visiting fellow of the James Madison Program at Princeton and a founding director of the Ludwig Erhard Forum in Berlin, which is dedicated to studying the legacy of German ordo liberalism. He is also Bruce Caldwell's co author in volume two of Hayek's biography. Welcome, Stefan. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ivan, for the invitation. Wonderful to be with you from Berlin tonight. So the title of the talk has changed very slightly. Uh, it was meant to be the history of neoliberalism. Now I smuggled in something tiny, which is the relevance of neoliberalism. And I hope I can convince you that it was a good addendum. Now, of course, the question, first of all, is why should we care or bother about something like neoliberalism, which has become such a term of abuse, some people say, or a swear word. But I do believe that um, it's an interesting artifact in terms of history of political economy, or even a beautiful one, if you want. Uh, and the second point which I would like to make is that uh, it has some relevance, as I hope to show, for classical liberals as the people in the room. I'm a regular attendant of the seminar, and so I hope that we can get to that in addition. So the notion of neoliberalism, as most of you probably are aware of, is multifaceted. Many people use it in so tons of ways that I've tried to basically compress it to three the three lies of neoliberalism, as I call it here. So the focus of the presentation will be um, uh, the first one, which was the way people used the term in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, especially. Uh, but of course, today, uh, since the 1970s, and especially over the past 20 years, it has become something which I call the proxy for evil. Um, so basically, if you are called a neoliberal, as uh, people might call somebody like me, uh, it means that you're an evil person who doesn't have the best intentions for the world we live in. Um, and yet, there is a third um, understanding of the notion, which I would like to share with you which is my personal one. And it's also the one which, um, which is why I actually like to use the notion. Let me also perhaps say from the beginning that I don't just like neoliberalism as a self-description. I call myself a neoliberal. Uh, but also I am um, not the greatest fan of the notion of classical liberalism, which might be a civilized provocation to a seminar, which is called a classical liberalism seminar. But I hope to show you why I'm not as a historian of economics, why I don't love uh, classical liberalism, even though I'm a member of the Montpellerin Society and many other organizations which self-clarify um, or self-identify um, as classical liberal. So usually when we talk about neoliberalism, we would start uh, from the colloque Walter Lippmann in 1938. And I will come to the colloque in a minute, uh, but I don't want to start with it. Instead, um, I would like to show you some other graphs which uh, show that if we zoom uh, via a very simple uh, Google engram in the decades before, so I started here in 1800 and ended in 1950, uh, you actually can see that the notion of neoliberalism pops up already briefly after the Napoleonic Wars. There is a discussion in France uh, as to what, neoliberal, what liberalism might mean after Napoleon. Or there is this one here, um, which certainly also pops up again in, after 1900 in England, et cetera, et cetera. So somehow we liberals, if I may say so, um, have a constant um, tendency, a constant proclivity, a constant, um, how should I say, a constant wish to redefine what liberalism means. And I think there is something productive, helpful, and um, um, something positive to that tendency. So let me introduce you to this um, procedural understanding of what neoliberalism could mean. And this I would like to do with this simple picture. To me as a historian of liberal political economy, liberalism, consists of many, many, many figures, which uh, we can group into generations. I'm not the greatest fan of the notion of schools, but we can also do that 
if you find the notion is cool in some points of the history of liberalism helpful. But what, what I would like to emphasize here is that anybody whom we remember in today's history of liberalism is actually a neoliberal in this understanding of the notion, which means that um, Adam Smith, whose Wealth of Nations today uh, celebrates uh, its birthday, was a neoliberal vis-a-vis -vis, uh, John Locke. John Stuart Mill was a neoliberal vis-a-vis -vis Smith and Locke, uh, or uh, Humboldt, if you want. So basically, anybody who we remember in the history of liberalism was an innovator. He added something new. It can be something substantively new. It can be something rhetorically new. But he added something, he or she, right? So, and, and this is this procedural this notion, procedural of, notion. Of, of constant, I hope that somebody can mute himself or herself, of, of constant innovation, of constant redefining what liberalism means for a certain generation or for a certain individual. And that is why I believe, as I hope to show you by the end of this talk, that we might today need our new neoliberalism for today's age. Now, if you look at the engram which I showed you, which is the one for neoliberalism, or at a similar engram for the notion of new liberalism, which became particularly uh, powerful in England around uh, 1900, you can see that um, we have those constant upswings, we have those constant bubbles of discussions um, and they have different reasons if you zoom into those different debates. Uh, it can be that there is something new in terms of a, some new ideational concerns. So in England and Germany around 1900, there were people um, who self-identified as new as new liberals who were concerned with the notion of inequality, very much as we are, uh, as many people are uh, um, concerned today. So should liberals um, be concerned um, with inequality as it was seen to be one of the greatest problems of the time by the book. Some said yes, some said no, and the ones who said yes uh, self-identified as new liberals. We can have some new technological concerns, as of course we also have today. And if you have a look at the debate between Charles Gilles, an important French liberal, and Matteo Pantaleoni, an Italian liberal around 1890, they were very much worried uh, about the notion of power, be connected, be connected, which could be connected to technological innovations. Um, and so the question was, uh, of course, uh, whether those technological innovations and the notion of power should be something taken uh, into account by liberals. If you look whether it was a defense of liberalism, where the notion of neoliberalism was used for a critique, you also see both. Uh, and you can see both in... I'm actually on Zoom. Believe it or not. Oh, good. Well, that's your—that's the uh, last talk, right? Let's. Uh, you're on let's Zoom, wait. and you're also not muted. Please yes. mute. Thank you, David. You're listening to. It. Okay, so um, if you look at um, whether the notion was used in a critique or in a defense of liberalism, you can see both. So in Austria, before World War I, you will have people in the Austrian school, like Hayek's teacher, Friedrich von Wieser, who actually said that he's looking for a new liberalism as a defensive uh, liberalism. After the war, after World War I, Mises was attacked from both the left and the right as uh, a neoliberal, meaning that he defended liberalism in a new way by his critique of socialism. So most, uh, the, the picture is very colorful. The picture has many, many shades of, uh, let's call it gray. Uh, but what you, what you can constantly see is that the term pops up and I find it interesting. Now let's zoom into specifically the colloquial to Lippmann, which was, I believe, uh, an important, uh, great event for liberalism. The collection of people who met there in Paris of 1938 was very colorful. Uh, not all of them uh, would uh, zoom into our webinar today, but um, it was a beautiful um, collection of people in those darkest hours for Western civilization and for liberalism right before World, with World War II and people were seeing the war coming. Um, so Lippmann, as probably uh, most of you know, was um, the um, liberal 
uh, or let's say the public intellectual of the United States uh, of the time, uh, whether you call him liberal or not, depends, of course, on how you use the word. But what is important and interesting about the conference, and here on the right, you see the transcripts of the conference, which have been edited um, in a very nice new edition. Here you see the journal, which I co-edited, where we had a special issue um, on the colloquial Lippmann after a conference we did in 2018. Um, what you have at the colloquial is this very fundamental question, uh, which pops up at any point of time uh, you saw in the graphs before, which is liberalism is not always winning. And in many sessions of our Stanford classical liberalism seminar, that is the sentiment. So you actually have two groups of people. You have people who say it's the fault of the others. So it's the fault of the left and the right that they killed liberalism. Those would be called paleoliberals. So they believe that old liberalism was just perfectly fine. People were not smart enough to like it. And so they fell for the temptations of the left or the right. Or you have the neoliberals, which at the Kulok Lippmann were uh, a large heterogeneous group, which had a sense that the failure of liberalism in the interwar period, but also before World War I already, was perhaps also the fault of the liberals. And so the neoliberals at the Kulok and also at the founding meeting at the Mont Pelerin Society were the ones who would say, well, let's assume that we made a mistake, that we, for example, focused too much on economics, that we didn't care too much to incorporate how modern democracy um, coexists with a liberal economic order, that we didn't think um, of notions of security, which both the left and the right um, offered in a much more attractive package so that people subscribed to the left and the right and not to liberalism. So in a certain sense, the neoliberals of the Colloque were the ones who, in my reading, showed more humility and more tenant, a higher tendency of self-criticism um, when it comes to allowing for um, the failure of liberalism um, at the time to be also the fault of the liberals themselves. If you look at the people, not just at the Colloque, but something which was forming at the time in the 1930s, you have all kinds of people, Hayek, the auto liberals, Röcke and Walter Eucken, but also that's what I would call the old Chicago school, what has been called the old Chicago school by many people, including James Buchanan, is one group. And then you have Mises, who in the notions of the slide before would be, would be the paleo liberal. And so a question comes up um, at the colloque, but also um, in many of the writings at the time, which I would focus on at calling it is there something like good interventionism? Is there something like an interventionism which is necessary so that the fragility of the liberal order, as it happened in the interwar period, does not repeat itself? So is there some new notion of the state? Is there some new role for the state so that this fragility does not repeat itself? Now, the answers which people on the slide provided were different. But the people who you see, other than Mises, uh, would at least find that question important. All of them bought into Mises' critique of socialism. They said, yeah, socialism is certainly not what we, would like, what we would like to go for. But they didn't quite buy into his understanding of interventionism or his critique of interventionism, which they found to be too generalistic or too, um, too um, 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 let's say, too unspecific. When it comes to this question, do we need, does a liberal order need interventions which can perhaps avoid the collapse of what happened before? We can then have a look at the Montpellier Society's founding meeting in 1947. And luckily, it was Caldwell edited this beautiful book, um, which uh, has provided us with the transcripts of the founding meeting. Here you can see uh, some of the archival materials. And if you read Bruce's book, which, uh, well, we should mention was published by Hoover. So it's uh, actually a perfect fit to the, to the seminar, which we have here. Um, if you read the transcripts, um, you actually see that the picture which you saw before, so that general question, whether we should have a look anew at the liberal order and its stability um, has 
something which uh, for something forms in the uh, at the at the founding meeting, which I would like to call the ordo liberal archipelago. Now, ordo liberalism, as you will see in a minute, is the German variety of neoliberalism. So now we can finally get specific. We can um, get a specific interpretation of it, of what neoliberalism in that one variety would mean, and I would like to focus on it. But at the founding meeting, you can actually see that it's not just a notion of the Freiburg School, of those Germans who were uh, at the meeting, so Walter Beuten and Wilhelm Röpke, but also you, you can see old Chicago, and that, include, that includes at the time Milton Friedman, if you look at his late 1940s and early 1950s publications, but also higher. And so you have really a, quite a broad coalition at the Montpellier and Society's meeting, which say, well, we have to think anew, right? So we need to rethink liberalism radically um, since things are not going well. Now, what would that mean? And let me now try to be specific. What is this German variety of neoliberalism, which uh, was called around 1950, ordoliberalism? So to begin with, um, there is this basic division between the process and the framework. The process is this super dynamic game which millions or billions of people are playing at any moment. But that game is embedded in a framework which is comparatively speaking, relatively speaking to the process, quite a static enterprise. So it's stable. And especially in times of fragility, so especially in times like the 1930s and 40s where everything is breaking apart, um, you need the framework. So the task of political economists is to provide intellectually, but also as public intellectuals, a liberal framework to which people playing the game, both as citizens and as economic agents, can actually subscribe. Um, a framework, a stable framework, which a stable liberal framework with rules, um, which people can take as a sort of an anchor, as an orientation point, in times where everything else is falling apart. And again, that applies not just to the Germans, but in the very same way to Frank Knight, Henry Simons, and uh, last but not least, Hayek. Um, the economy is seen as one of the differentiated orders of society. So unlike the pre-modern community, modern society consists of those boxes. And each of those boxes has a different logic um, and has to be studied by specialists like the economists, like the political scientists, like the legal uh, scholars. So the economy is one of those boxes. It has its own life. It has, it has its own logic. But most importantly, it has to be understood as an interdependent order, which is interdependent to all those other orders in society, right? And the tragedy of the interwar period was that many economists, including the ones who were actually meeting here, were studying the economy only, um, which we could call isolating economics, so studying the equilibria and disequilibria, as many people were studying during the Great Depression, without quite understanding that the economic order through those interfaces, through those arrows, which you can see here, um, can actually send um, totally destructive impulses uh, to the order of the state or to the legal order. So studying the economic order only um, can work in stable times. But when something uh, is happening as a great upheaval, like the Great Depression within the economic order, you should actually study the economic order in the context um, of those other orders and, the, and bear in mind the potential that the economy can potentially destroy the whole of society. So contextual, a contextual approach at the uh, a contextual look at the economy is fundamentally important in those times. Um, and uh, I mean, we can come to the end. Uh, how about uh, what, how we should think about the times today? But I would suggest that today's fragility also should encourage us to think of the economy as being embedded in society. But again, it's just one of the orders of society. It's not equivalent to society, um, and it's the one where the self-organization again, the birthday of the world of nations today, where the self-organization of people is most clearly visible, but we can, of course, also study that in those other orders as well. Now, the embeddedness of the economy, which we, um, so this is now the blue box being um, layered in various um, frameworks. 
the game which is played by those millions or billions of people, the process, as I called it before, is embedded in rules. Now, this is not new to this audience. Um, I also want to emphasize that many of the notions which I'm introducing here are not radically new in the history of liberalism. I just believe that that generation specifically, the neoliberals of the 30s and 40s, and the Germans, uh, the German border liberals more specifically, uh, were perhaps most systematic in synthesizing what, had, what, what has been there in the history of political economy for quite some time before. Of course, we know of the game metaphor. Of course, we know about the rules of the game. It just tends to be the case in the history of ideas that we tend to forget. And so in those meetings which I discussed in this course, which are at the center of the presentation, came to emphasize things anew which they believed had been forgotten and which had to be re-emphasized um, for the times Stephen, we're there, talking about. Stefan, there are a couple of questions. Yes, okay? we, can make a, we can make a break. Yes, sure. Yeah, yeah. If, first of all, if you just if you can give us a basic definition of neoliberalism, I think there is also a question by Sarita. Feel free to ask the question yourself or I can read it. Yeah, I can, I can um, raise it. I'm sorry, I'm not. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, all right. Um, so my question, I mean, no, this goes back about five minutes or so, but I, I wonder if you are um, associating the Chicago School and Friedman a little too closely with the German Ordo School. Um, and I understand that there are probably some overlaps and some agreements between them, but it seems to me that the Chicago School and Friedman are more laissez-faire than ordo liberalism. Ordo liberalism, that Freiburg school seems to be just a bit more statist than I think Friedman and the Chicago school were comfortable with. Although you could probably make a distinction between the Chicago school and say the harder, more Austrian libertarians on the other side. I, I completely agree with you on that as well. Um, and I do also question the neo the, the definition that you seem to be giving for neoliberalism is that anything past the point of John Locke is a neoliberal. In so far, so you seem to be saying that John Locke was liberal, but that liberalism is essentially like an ossified, um, very um, historically bound event or movement. Um, of John Locke's or somewhere in that era. And, the, and so everything past that point is no longer liberal. And I guess I have, I, I guess I'm not sure that that's the best way to handle the term liberal. Um, but anyway, I know there were questions about how you define that. So that's all I've got. Okay, so let's start with this one. Um, and thank you for the questions. And it's important that you raise them during the talk. So I don't want to be misunderstood. Actually, I meant to, so when we, if we want to pinpoint uh, the way you asked the question uh, just a minute ago, actually I meant to say just the opposite. So thank you for clarifying. So liberalism to me is a constant procedure of reformulating what liberty means. So it, it start, doesn't have to start with Locke. I mean, of course, many people can trace it back to ancient times. If we go beyond the Western, uh, understanding of liberty, we can go to other cultures, right? We can start from anywhere. And then we tend to understand that liberty is, a, is an important value. It lives in various orders, um, 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 let's say, um, depending on the institutional framework, uh, it can thrive better or worse. And so ever since, ever since um, people uh, so that's it. Ever since people, scholars are thinking about that, we have this constant attempt to pinpoint what it means to have liberty and orders coexisting. So that's what I meant, meant to do. So it's nothing ossified, quite on the contrary. It is an attempt which each generation starts anew to say, what does it mean to have a liberal order? And when it comes to Chicago and Friedman, um, so first of all, Many people have emphasized, and I would also like to do that. I have, a, I have a paper in history of political economy, which does that in greater detail. The pre-World War II generation of Chicago economists, more specifically Frank Knight, and I think Lee Beck, perhaps, 
um, more specifically Frank Knight and Henry Simon, so the teachers of the Stigler Friedman generation and what comes later. But your, your question was specifically about Friedman. Um, and my personal reading of Friedman is that he is very close to what we have here. So if you read, for example, his piece in 1951 in the Norwegian magazine Parliament, uh, you find pretty much what I have in a slide, which is still forthcoming, um, as his um, economic philosophy. Later, Chicagoans and probably uh, George Stigler as well uh, would certainly uh, diverge. But if you if you take the young Friedman of who had just visited Europe uh, at the Montpellier and Society in 1947, he's pretty, pretty, pretty close to what I've been describing here. Shall we continue or shall we take one more question? David has a question. Uh, yeah, could I follow up? Um, the problem I'm seeing is that if you say it's just redefined or that wasn't the word used, some term like that, reformulated, well, then who gets to reformulate it and does it mean anything? Well, I think, let me put it like that. Any, anybody who is respectful to the tradition of liberalism, so that all the generations who've been there before should be aware of what has been said. And if you find a reason to disagree with what has been said, or if you find a reason to say that something in the doctrine of liberalism as a legacy of that doctrine exists, doesn't apply to the times in which we live, you are free to reformulate it and to suggest that, well, perhaps in general or for the times in which we live, uh, it means something different. And then the next generation, the next person, basically, if you take it very individualistically, is free to do the same. And then we have a competition of neoliberalisms um, as a sequence in the course of time. Uh, and you are free to um, subscribe to the one which you find most convincing. So in that regard, um, there is a doctrine, but that doctrine is constantly um, reformulated. And by the way, Mises, if we take him as um, uh, the one who didn't like the notion uh, as it was used in 1930s was certainly a super important innovator in uh, formulating liberalism. So anybody who we remember added something otherwise who would remember him. I mean, many liberals, many people in the history of liberalism have been, have been forgotten and rightly so because what they added uh, was not seen as important by later generations. So you're free to innovate and then if People later on uh, believe that you have anything of value to say, uh, you would be remembered. If not, you are just a footnote. I can put it like that. Thank you. Michael. Yeah, so just a few comments, and uh, I'm enjoying this so far and I'm learning something, but I would say most Americans, when they think of liberalism, uh, don't use Ordo and Neo, but they trace it first to Mill and then beyond then earlier to Locke and others uh, and, you know, um, natural law and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of surprised that you have, haven't mentioned Mill. I joined about 10 minutes late, maybe you did. And then my interpretation of the rejection of socialism was quite a bit stronger in Hayek, who was rejecting economic planning in general, not just the socialist variety with the state ownership uh, of capital. Um, and for example, the planning that came out of World War II, there was a big move to have economic planning in the United States in order to avoid the problems of the depression and so on. And that led into, um, uh, that kind of maybe combined with Keynesian thoughts about the macroeconomy into uh, much more intervention. Um, so I'm just kind of curious how all that fits into your framework. Okay, uh, thank you for that. So I did mention Mill, let me show you. So I'm Mill sorry. Here. Here. Yeah, <laughs> so he's one of those important innovators. And when it comes to Hayek, well, if you look at the road to certain, he has this interesting, curious notion, I find it, of planning for competition, which basically boils down to what we're talking about here. And if I proceed uh, one more slide, you will be also able to see what I mean uh, by that, which is this one. And I believe that um, this is the Hayekian planning for competition, as you can find it in the Road to Serfdom and then more expanded in the Constitution of Liberty. So, um, so the question which was posed earlier, um, what is liberalism? 
in my view, or let's say in the view of the generation we're discussing here, is how can old and liberty coexist sustainably? So how can we create a societal order, a modern societal order, not a pre-modern community, but a modern societal order where we have liberty which does not destroy the order and we have, where, where we have an order which doesn't destroy liberty? Because both of those things happen in modernity. So how do we avoid that? Well, the answer to that is basically those six points here. The constant quest for anybody interested in liberal political economy is how do we divide, how, what kind of a division of labor do we have between the state, the market, and civil society? So laissez-faire as a core of 19th century uh, political economy applies, but we have to always think about the rules of the game within which laissez-faire produces good results, right? So um, in a certain sense, it's a conditional subscription to laissez-faire. We can have a free process once the rules are uh, fine. If the rules are dysfunctional, as they were uh, during the Great Depression, laissez-faire can actually destroy the whole society. So we have to think about the framework as we had it on the slides before. What it actually boils down to, and this is something which has always been uh, important, but which of course became even more important after World War I with the advent of uh, full uh, fledged democracy, is how do we have a market economy and a state uh, where the state is a democratic entity which likes privileges, but as we know, uh, general rules are what liberals subscribe to, and yet democratic order tends to provide privileges which, comes, which would generate a constant entanglement of state and market. So how can we, by constitutional provisions, try to disentangle that? Um, we should take that generation would suggest power seriously. Power can come from the market and capture the state. Of course, it also can come from the state and do bad things to the market. So all sources of power should be taken seriously. And something which is emphasized here is that competition is not just in Hayekian terms of discovery procedure, but also this empowerment procedure, which means that the more competition is enabled, the more the other side of the market uh, doesn't have power over you. Um, and that will also uh, have some consequences in antitrust. Um, so the, what we had at the Colloque Lippmann and even more specifically at the Montpelerin Society's group meeting is an openly normative subscription to what they call the competitive order. So less affair within rules should be, should have the, the, the shape, the rules of that uh, game should be um, specifically targeted and enabling competition. And of course, in the context of the time of the most deglobalized economy, which we had, um, globalization had totally fallen apart. Um, this was even more important than it would have been, let's say, pre-World War I. So all of those, um, uh, all of that emphasis is not just a general theory, but it's also a theory which is particularly topical for um, that time, which we're talking about 1930s and 40s, but it can become topical and relevant for other times which are comparable, perhaps our times as well. And the good order, which in the economy is the competitive order, doesn't have to be efficient only. Efficiency is a necessary condition for a good order. But also, it should be a humane order, meaning that it should um, generate, uh, it should enable lives in liberty and justice, um, and that should also be ensured uh, if political economists think about what a good order could be. Now, I will become even more specific, and I'm happy that we have uh, plenty of time for discussing. Now, all of that I understand sounds a little bit Germanic, um, but I find it. I would like to show you, not just because it's my new employer, um, but also because we can actually make the case that beyond Keynesianism, which of course became powerful um, in the course of the 1940s and 50s in the Anglo-Saxon world, those ideas which I just presented to you were probably the second most powerful idea in the most immediate um, um, post-war uh, decades. It started in Germany, but it also had repercussions for uh, the European Union as it evolved in the 1950s and 60s. And so what we saw as this order liberal consensus at the Montpelerin Society, and again, I do believe, firmly believe that actually Friedman uh, belonged to that uh, at the time 
uh, at least, but also later we can certainly debate it in the discussion, found one specific political entrepreneur who was Ludwig uh, Erhard. He later also or pretty soon became a member of the Montpellier Society, but at the time he was just an economic administrator whom the Americans had found in the American zone, and they came to believe that um, he is an important administrator. But then, as um, uh, the Allies were wondering what to do with Germany, um, something important happened. So in 1948, uh, in June, it was quite obvious that you need a new currency. Uh, this was pretty much a consensus uh, which everybody shared. What was not consensual at all is what to do with the Nazi economy, which in 1936 had introduced um, a price freeze. So most prices were frozen uh, to prevent open inflation from happening. Um, so what was not so that you get a new currency, which is the first notion here, was consensual because the uh, old uh, ice mark was, com was completely valueless. But it was not consensual at all that you need, that you actually knew in, you need free prices, so that you need to liberalize the price system, which of course initially uh, created uh, quite a bit of inflation. Um, for, let's say. Uh, prices which were not affordable because everybody got a very, very tiny amount of that new currency. But it proved seminal uh, because all of a sudden people would see that uh, markets, markets function. And that is what, at least in the narrative, in the liberal narrative, started what has been called a, an economic miracle uh, and which was uh, emulated by other countries later on. And I'm born in Bulgaria, so it also had some repercussions of course, for the post-communist economies when things had to be designed after 1990. Now, all of that was a neoliberal project. So Erhard quite often used the notion of neoliberalism as contrasting that to, uh, to, to the older types of liberalism. But of course, famously, it has also been called the social market economy. Now, many Hayekians, and I'm a Hayekian, um, like Hayek's um, approximation of social to being a weasel word. Uh, so this is the weasel, and as uh, most of you probably in the world know, Hayek says that the weasel word sucks out uh, any content of, um, um, of, a, of, a, of a notion, just as the weasel sucks out um, the um, content of an egg. Now, the funny part here is that if you look at an ermine here, which as we know is one of the noblest first in the history, of uh, royalties, um, uh, the ermine is actually made of a, of a weasel, right? So the question here is whether a rhetorical twist like the social market economy, which to begin with uh, was a new notion, um, which meant um, um, to convince Germans that they should subscribe to this capitalist economic order after 1949, uh, perhaps was not a weasel word, uh, or perhaps not only a weasel word, but also something which was seminal for the success of what actually was a very hardcore um, um, liberal order in the 1950s and 60s in West Germany. So if you look at um, the, the, the way how neoliberalism is used at the time, uh, you can actually see that in the defenses of those reforms of the 50s and 60s. So you get a new central bank, which is independent. You get an antitrust um, office, which is important in disentangling the totally uh, cartelized Nazi economy. You see that the notion of neoliberalism is um, quite powerful and quite often used to emphasize that there is something new happening, right? Germans were never in love with liberalism. Um, so you needed to provide them with a new category to convince them that, yes, this is a capitalist liberal economy, um, but um, it is something new. So there is something inventive, creative about what we're doing. So as Ivan mentioned, I'm working with Bruce Caldwell together on volume two of the Hayek biography, and I'm going through all those newspaper pieces which mention Hayek at some point in the archives. And you can see that the notion is important. So um, in the elite discourse of the time, it was important to emphasize that this is something new. Um, now, what was the new part? Well, some people would say, like Hayek, that the market economy is socially perceived, so we don't have to call it a social market economy. 
um, a social market economy is basically like um, um, well, um, it's just an um, yeah, you basically say two times the same thing, or, or do we have to make it social? Now, if you remember the graph which I showed you with the stable rules and the um, uh, and the dynamic process, there were proponents of the social market economy within the neoliberal camp, the German neoliberals, to say that well, security is important, and so it should be provided um, by uh, by the state. But it's not only about material security, it's really about um, providing a stable rule of law framework, providing rules on, on which people can, um, can rely. Um, so, and again, it's super important to always emphasize that it should be a competitive order, which means that you have to destroy market power, which um, in the times where the gut and globalization were still quite a weak, Thing, uh, we're still uh, actually pretty much uh, concentrated. So making it social doesn't mean provide welfare for everybody in the sense of welfare benefits. It means provide security, provides also, provide also, um, um, provide a sense of security, provide a sense of access to uh, to um, to this new uh, West German state. And its provisions, but above all, it means provide trust and provide the sense that people are not uh, so that, that the power concentrations, which were typical for the times before, are being destroyed, especially by competition. So the, the, the economic miracle, as it was produced at the time, and which many people have said that it was not a miracle, it was basically basic economics. Um, and some catch up development of, a, of an economy which was heavily destroyed. Um, and I, in a certain sense, subscribe to that. It was not a miracle, um, as seen by economists. I had a component which is miraculous to me and which um, I believe is interesting and important. So, the person who coined the notion social market economy, somebody who worked closely with uh, Rudi Erhardt, called it from the beginning an ironic formula. Ironic, like Irene. Uh, the symbol of goddess of peace and, and um, harmony in, in, the, in ancient Greece. So the social market economy should not all only be about the economy. It should ideally, and luckily it turned out to be, a tool which enables German society, but of course also other societies, to actually find peace. What does it mean to find peace? Well, first of all, find peace within itself. So think about Germany in 1946 or 47. It's probably the most unequal society you can imagine. There is somebody who still has a house. There is somebody who has a piece of land, but his house has been bombed out. And then there is somebody as a refugee from the Eastern provinces who has literally nothing. So it's a totally materially unequal society. And then a society which still has millions of Nazis, socialists, communists, few liberals, varieties of conservatives. So a totally polarized society, as polarized as probably most societies today. And yet this interesting rhetorical twist suggested that all those ideas, the Nazis of course uh, excluded, um, should be able to talk to each other, should actually, must actually talk to each other um, and try to find compromises in setting up this new society. And that would create peace. And luckily it did. So one party, one idea after the other subscribed to that social market economy, it became and has become until today actually quite a consensual formula. But interestingly enough, and this was what the neoliberal started at, um, at the Kolok Lippmann, West German society also found its peace with capitalism, which is actually quite miraculous because um, after the war, uh, the, the, the famous narrative was that uh, National socialism was, in a certain sense, a result of capitalism. And yet, this society, the same society 20 years later, in the late 60s already, would actually have found its peace with capitalism. It was called differently, it was framed differently. So, the framework was different, it was communicated in a different way. Um, but it found its peace, both as a democracy and as, um, as the attitude of the general citizen to the economic order. Now, neoliberalism today, and I'm coming to the end, neoliberalism today has, of course, become a swear word. Uh, but it has become a swear word because it actually, in the usual 
um, the usual derogative, uh, um, let's say, usage, neutrally speaking, of the word, it actually becomes pretty much the exact opposite of what we just discussed. So a sense of stability, a sense of stable, reliable rules, which are provided to the normal citizen, so that the dynamics of the, um, of the processes is bearable, um, is actually um, seen to be not important, or this is what neoliberals have been accused of, of having, having destroyed the welfare state, and by that having destroyed uh, the sense of stability for uh, the communities um, which have which provided um, the, that, that stability. So that is the one opposite to what actually those people meant to have. And then, of course, um, neoliberalism would also mean today that economy, that the economy as an order has infringed um, on all the others, uh, on all other orders. So basically, um, liberal political economists um, have uh, think of everything um, of the state, uh, law, et cetera, et cetera, in economistic terms. And so uh, the economy has actually destroyed society by imposing its logic on, on the whole of society. And again, this was not meant to be uh, in the original self-description of the 30s and 40s. When did it happen? Well, it started in Latin America in the 70s, certainly amplified um, um, in the context of the Thatcher Reagan Revolution, Eastern Europe, and um, um, the reforms after the fall of the wall uh, carried all that in addition. But of course, the financial crisis was the moment when neoliberalism became what it is here and then exposed that notion of economistic destruction of stability uh, became imposed, exposed also on what happened in Eastern Europe, what happened in the 80s and what happened in the 70s. So we have a, an avalanche of a literature which has this one notion. It means, again, evil, as I said in the beginning, and evil means that it destroyed democracy and that, that it destroyed society by making it an economistic um, um, thing. So this is what uh, we have as the most common usage of the notion today. Now, the question is, again, as in 1930s, and this is a self-critical question to us in the room, could it be that a tiny part or some part of that of those accusations which are addressed um, as uh, people like us quite often um, are actually perhaps not quite wrong. So have we been perhaps negligent about the stability which people need so that they bear with the dynamics of the market economy? Or have we been perhaps excessively emphasizing the language of economics, which is, uh, I find it beautiful as an economist, many people don't find it as beautiful. And so if they're confronted with that language, it's perhaps not the most beautiful in which people can actually, normal people out there, citizens, can love uh, a free society. So is it perhaps our, to a certain extent, our own fault that we are in the trap of being called uh, neoliberals and being accused of those things? So the question which, with which I would like to conclude, and then I have a final slide, is if we have Locke, or again, anybody we like to have as the initiator of thinking about order and liberty. And then we have the Hayek generation, and then we have ourselves. So this is a screenshot of, uh, of, of our website. To what extent are we, as the next generation of classical liberals, um, to what extent should we think about changing things uh, which the Hayek generation um, um, formulated and which might be 90% right, but uh, not 100%. As I said in the beginning, and this is my final slide, um, I'm a person who self-identifies as a neoliberal, and I have found it to be a helpful tool in many ways. And let me conclude by inviting you to think of doing the same, um, perhaps. So first of all, I've always found it, or not always, I've, in, in, on many occasions, I found it to be an interesting opener of conversations, right? So if you say that you're a neoliberal, people are like, 
quite often, let's say, surprise. So I call it a civilized provocation. And then you begin conversations which otherwise perhaps would not start. As I said in the beginning, I'm not the greatest fan of the notion of classical liberalism. Let me just say why. If you call something classical, in my understanding of classical music or classical art, you put it on a pedestal. And then there is at least a danger and a risk that you begin to become uncritical of this classical, beautiful thing which has to be emulated and imitated. And you don't quite keep remembering that um, this beautiful thing, liberalism, should actually be not just preached and emulated by you, but also perhaps questioned when it comes to uh, the world in which we live. So are we providing the citizens out there uh, the, best, um, the best agenda given the times in which we live and times change? So what are the principles of liberalism? Let's say the end principles which we have um, in the history. What of, the, what of them are the relevant ones, the really important ones which matter today? And perhaps 20 years ago, when globalization was different from the one we are entering right now, it's different principles that really, really matter that we have to emphasize. And perhaps we have different trade offs. So that we have N minus N principles, which are really important in a context today. And the 1930s and 40s, unfortunately, remind us of the times today in the fragility. So we can learn from them. But of course, we cannot learn one to one. We have to learn and nevertheless rethink. I think we have to rethink our rhetoric, which, in my personal experience of uh, classical liberals, has quite, has quite often been not very convincing to people who are not sympathetic to our ideas. We also should be careful about what coalitions we uh, are in. And those coalitions have, of course, changed. The left is not the same, the right is not the same as they used to be. So uh, I think we have to be um, we have to be careful. Finally, and this is my final uh, word, uh, I think the power of the neoliberal generation of the 1930s and 40s was that it provided a positive program. So this let's affair within rules, and then let's talk about the rules. Let's talk about something, a system of rules called the social market economy. Uh, proved helpful and convincing to uh, some citizens in some Western societies. In contrast, um, quite often we are um, focusing on what should be undone by what um, um, what bad regulations have to be um, done away with, and this is certainly important, uh, but not just rhetorically, also in terms of content, it has it, Quite often, in my personal experience, turns us in Cassandras, which are warning of bad things happening. Many of the, many of those warnings are important, but I think those warnings should be complemented by a coherent, convincing, positive program of what liberalism means in the crazy times, if I may say so, which we are living through today and which are different from the times 20, 30, or 40 years ago. Let me conclude with that, and I'm now really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Stefan, sorry. Uh, so we have a question by Sebastian first, and then John. Should I undo the... Um... Yeah, you can uh, remove the yeah, slide. So okay. We, so we, we can see each other better. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ivan. I, um, I really enjoyed the talk, and uh, um, um, some of you guys will hear me since Ivan has been kind enough to invite me to talk about... Uh, the most uh, vivid experience with uh, neoliberalism and the Chicago Boys. But let me make a couple of points here, some of them uh, historical, and then uh, uh, some comments. Um, I, uh, Boskin and Sarita make a good points about Hayek, uh, Chicago, uh, Friedman, and neoliberals. Um, and Mike made the point about Hayek and planning. And I think that's very important. And as an anecdote, um, the Economists that pushed the hardest for planning in the 1930s in the US was Rex Dugwell, who was one of the brains trust and uh, worked with FDR. And President Hatches at the University of Chicago wanted to hire him. And the econ department voted unanimously against him. And Hatches was hired anyway by the University of Chicago and they created a special department on planning for him. And when he retired, it disappeared. So there is this connection that adds a lot of, 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 of flavor to this discussion. Now, 
Hayek was also at Chicago. So I, um, um, about four years ago, I interviewed Al Harberger, who arrived as an associate professor when Hayek was there and was already a full professor when Hayek left. How often did he and the faculty talk to Hayek? And he said, never, absolutely never. And I said, how many times did you talk to Hayek while you were in Chicago during the, your first, uh, when they, you coincided, which was like eight years. And he said, we never talked. He never came to the seminars and we never went to the fifth floor in the social science building where Hayek was. So it's uh, anecdotal, but I think it's very interesting. The point I want to make is that I think it's very, very important to start this conversation by reading The Good Society by Walter Lippmann which is the book that propels the colloque. Unfortunately, in the minutes of the colloque, we don't see what Hayek said because though there were no notes on what Hayek said. We saw Mises against Lippmann and they were very, very vast discussions. And I think that that's very interesting also in terms of whether the new movement would be called neo-capitalism or a, a neoliberalism, and it was just by chance. They were coming to an end. They didn't have any more time to stay at the colloque and they decided neoliberalism. And the final point I want to make also in an anecdotal way, since I'm gonna be talking about uh, uh, the, the, the Chilean case, is that in 1981, Hayek visited Chile and he was interviewed. And the interviewer asked him um, in the context of the neoliberal doctrine, how his views differed from those of Karl Popper. And this is what Hayek said, and I'm quoting now. He did not accept, excuse me, he did not accept, accept the tag of neoliberal. And this is what he said. The problem is that we are not neoliberals. Those who define themselves in this way are not liberals at all. They are socialists. That's what Hayek said. So it adds, I think, a little flavor, as I said, to this whole conversation. Okay. That was in 1981, by the way. Yes, let me reply from the final point onwards. So, um, um, Hayek has said similar things about, um, so if you, if you look at his pronouncements in the late 1970s, and he's asked about, um, about the German order liberals, he says, well, in the 1940s, and this was the time I was talking about, um, I was very close to them, but they did not develop uh, as I have developed. So in a certain sense, um, the neoliberals, as they call themselves today, again, the Germans in Germany, and he was living in Germany at that time in the late 70s again, are not my friends anymore or not as they used to be. Now, first of all, I think there is something important to um, to distinguish in Hayek himself. Um, a Hayek of the 30s and 40s, and this brings me to your point about the planning, was, um, as I would put it, occupied with different problems or was occupied with a notion of, um, uh, with, let's say with the knowledge problem and with the limitations of knowledge in a slightly different way than he would be in 1979 or 1981. And let me put it in, in the following terms. So Hayek in 1979 or 1981 is the Hayek we most uh, broadly know. So pretense of knowledge is what we should worry about. And people who um, do not uh, emphasize that strongly enough are beyond uh, my circle of friends. Now, if you think of Hayek in 1930s and 40s, if you read Planning in the Economic System or The Road to Serfdom or The Constitution of Liberty, you can actually get a different sense. Of course, the knowledge problem matters, but especially in the 30s and 40s, so in a time of urgency where everything is falling apart, you can read Hayek in a quite different way. Of course, our knowledge is imperfect, but we as liberals, have to offer a set of institutions, imperfect as our knowledge is about the quality of those institutions, and we have to offer uh, that framework of rules um, to the citizen. And this is what he tries to do as a sketch in the road to serpent and as a full fledged version in the Constitution of Liberty. So, certainly, his planning is not the planning of the socialists, uh, but he calls it the planning for competition, which I mentioned is planning of rules. So, you should not try to plan 
the game, the game should be played uh, by, of course, the individuals, as any liberal would say. But that that can only work whilst while while the ones the rules have been planned smartly. And again, smartly doesn't mean perfectly. It means with the best knowledge which we have from legal and economic history. This is my personal reading of him in the 30s and 40s. And again, it's not that not just that he differs in the 30s and the 70s. It's also that the times differ. Right, so in the 30s and 40s, there is a sense of urgency, which is not there anymore in the 70s and 80s. And also in the 70s and 80s, the window of opportunity, the window of what can be done in the very stable context of the Cold War is much more narrow than it used to be in the 30s and 40s. So he's preoccupied with those much more abstract uh, questions and rules, as opposed to much more practical uh, rules issues uh, of the 30s and 40s. So, I think there is a shift of emphasis within himself, and there is a shift in the times and in the notion to what extent fragile times need a liberal proposal, or stable times can actually leave time to the scholar uh, to emphasize that our knowledge is so imperfect that we should not, uh, we should yeah, not, be, not be as specific as he was in the 30s and 40s. Um, I'm totally, I totally agree with you about Hayek in Chicago, which we are currently working on. Uh, I was lucky enough at the NPS meeting at Stanford in 2020 to talk myself to Al Harberger about that, and I read your interview. So this non-interaction between the Econ Department and Hayek uh, is quite stunning. Um, so um, um, yeah, if you believe in division of knowledge, as he would always emphasize, this is not what, what you should do if you're in the same building. Um, but I understand that. Um, I'm, I, I'm aware of, of, of I'm aware of that, and I really like that you mentioned the book itself. So the good, the good society. It's, uh, um, and if you look at the uh, at the minutes of the colloque, they end in an interesting way. Given all the heat, uh, the heated debate which you mentioned, they end they end with a strange consensus, because also Mises would say that. I cannot now just quote from memory, but he says, yes, we need this new center for the, I don't know, inter, um, international liberalism, something like that. And the purpose of that center is that we need to think further about interventions and what interventions mean today, right? So again, you have this emphasis, which I tried to make in the, in the talk that uh, the liberal project, the project of liberal political economy is never terminated, is never complete, never perfect. Um, instead, we, including him, who is often portrayed as a dogmatic, which I don't buy into, we have the constant quest to keep thinking and keep um, refining what actually an intervention means and won't, uh, especially bad interventions mean to a liberal. Okay. John Pogan. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, this has been very interesting. But I want to go back to the sort of basic linguistic question. You, you call yourself a neoliberal. <clears throat> and, you know, we've been talking, I'm, I'm interested to learn that that term uh, has been around for 100 years, but it seems like it meant a very different thing to the people you've been talking about than today. Um, as, as I understand the term in current discourse, neoliberal means roughly the policies of uh, Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, Larry Summers in the mid 1990s, uh, by which I mean um, um, not as bad as, not as socialist as Bernie Sanders would like, but uh, nonetheless, uh, very high taxes with a strong amount of redistribution, a, um, a very present regulatory state that nonetheless will try to reform a little bit and, and sand the edges off its disincentives. Uh, trade, yes, we do have WTO and supposed globalization, but trade is run through these massive, uh, you know, trade deals, which are managed mercantilism, not good old fashioned, uh, you know, no tariffs, come and go as much as you want, uh, sort of free trade. Uh, and so a very large role of government in life, um, nothing like classical liberalism. Um, now, what we were talking about sounded like, um, disputes between what I would call classical liberals who had 
some other, I'm interested to learn that they had the word neoliberal attached to what they were doing. I guess nothing that's been around a hundred years can just use its old term. We always have to make it the new whatever, even though it's exactly the same as the old whatever to try and make it uh, attractive. But um, it, it does seem like we're talking about two very distinctly different things. And that, you know, to the extent we're talking about a program going forward, a positive program within this group and what you sort of laid out, I would call it the program of make classical liberalism um, uh, a, um, uh, salient and, and, a, and a program for positive things in the future. So I'm curious, do you disagree with that, that in the current, you know, as liberal itself changed meanings night and day, it seems like neoliberal changed meanings night and day when it became an insult from socialists who said, oh, the evil Bill Clinton who wanted to suffer some amount of private sector left, uh, and we wouldn't want to call ourselves that, would be. It, it sounds like you really want to call yourself what I would call a, a classical liberal. So help me with the language. Okay, Thank you. so this is immensely important. Thank you for that. I mean, if we just uh, if we just have a look, what uh, if we just distinguish the U.S. and Europe, um, and certainly it was already mentioned that liberalism already means something quite different in the two things, uh, in those two entities. Um, I, I fully agree with you that neoliberalism means very different things to different people, but also if we just take those two um, bubbles of the transatlantic uh, region, what you said as the common understanding of neoliberalism in the US uh, would not be the one in Europe. So in Europe, um, what is mostly associated with it Today, as I would understand it, somebody living in Germany, but being quite often in Eastern Europe, is it's very it's very much focused on issues of austerity. What happened after the Euro crisis? Um, there is this top-down approach, uh, which uh, which you had saw so some technocrats, but not Larry Summers, uh, rather some people in uh, Brussels or um, yeah, basically in some European institutions imposing some. Uh, Let's say constraints, heavy constraints on national democracies. So that's what it mean, that, that's what it would mean to many people in Europe. Um, now, again, um, and that's why I call it a civilized provocation to call yourself a neoliberal, because people would then say that you cannot mean to be that, right? And then I would try to say, well, no, I'm not that, but I do like to say that we might need a new version of liberalism. Now, I fully agree with you that we can call it the classical liberalism for our times, right? But I would love to, to have that emphasis, right? So in many classical liberal communities, which we, which we have and um, which we share, it strikes me that um, quite often we take those principles, which we know from, uh, from history, um, and we just apply them one to one uh, to today, even though the principles can be, again, from a very stable time, like the Cold War. And then the question is, how do we apply them today? But again, your major point is those notions differ in various languages. The rhetorical battles which you have to face whenever you use any term are very different in various languages. The degree of the provocation which you have using the notion is different. In Germany, you can always say, well, I'm neoliberal in the sense I just mentioned. So there is a shortcut to the discussion, uh, which I just outlined. And I understand that it's different in, in, in other countries. But let me let me just end by answering or let, by emphasizing that I, especially when talking to young people, uh, which I do a lot, uh, not just my students, but various liberal groups, um, I do like to emphasize this constant necessity to reformulate and refine. And that uh, impetus, I believe, is well captured um, in that graph of the neo, 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 neo chain of reformulation. Could I, could I follow up? Because it's been a great talk, but you keep saying it, but I never, what, what are the five ways that you think classical liberalism needs to be reformulated for our time versus just applied as it is? Okay. Do it, you know, suffer so, with access in a welfare state or, or industrial policy to counter China or, you know, what, what are your five things that uh, uh, classical liberals need to give up on to be relevant today? Okay. Um, 
it's not what I've been thinking while preparing the talk. Uh, so let me perhaps end by saying that like in 10 minutes from now, I will now start thinking and I'll reply in, in, a, in a few minutes, okay? Um, um, yeah, I will open up a small field here and I will come up with the five things in, in a few moments, okay. <laughs> Salida. Salida. Um, yeah. So, um, Stefan, first, I just want to say thank you so much for this talk. I know we're we're being critical, but honestly, it was a really brilliant talk and um, intriguing. And I'm really grateful because um, there is, and even in this group, <laughs> there's a lot of talks that advertised a definition of neoliberalism or a history of neoliberalism. And often I've walked away not really feeling like um, we've delved into those issues and I really feel like yours did. So thank you so much for that opportunity. Um, I, I, what, one of the biggest strengths I think of what it is that you did today was, and this is strongly coming out, I think with your interaction with John now is a defense of what you're calling neoliberalism and you're associating very strongly with ordo liberalism, which is um, this Freiburg school. And I, I, I honor that you are defending it as um, not only a reputable extension of liberalism or classical liberalism, but perhaps the most reputable or the one that um, deserves the mantle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I agree, though, with, with John and um, Michael and various others, though, that it does seem as though you are collapsing um, collapsing um, liberal adjacent philosophies into two categories, which is you're identifying as a neoliberalism, and then you say classical liberalism, but I think that what you really mean by that is libertarianism. So I... I think it's libertarianism versus what you're calling neoliberalism, but it does seem like there's at least three categories. And the one that's missing is what we would just call liberalism, because I think it's a perfectly good term. We don't have to put the classical in front of it. I agree with you. I don't love the, the term classical liberalism. From what I can tell, it was James Buchanan who made that like a really, really big thing. And when I read James Buchanan and he talks about classical liberalism, it sounds a whole lot more like libertarianism than it does anything that I would recognize as classical liberal thought. Um, so taking libertarianism off the table for a second, isn't there a distinction between center right and center left? What John was talking about with Clinton at all, I would call that center left. And I do think that it corresponds pretty well to the ordo liberalism in Germany. I would call all of that center left. Now, it's still centrist and it's still, you could say, within the realm of liberalism. But I think it does have enough of a, if you will, a social activism that it is perhaps something substantively different than a center right perspective, which really tries to hold the door shut against a lot of governmental intervention without it being a completely libertarian theory. So why can't we have libertarianism in its own place? Because when there's a libertarian in the room, we're all wrong. They are above us all. That's fine. Okay. But can't below it, can't below it, there be essentially liberalism and neoliberalism, i.e. center right, center left. And I just want to add closing here that John Dewey is a name that has not been mentioned um, so far here. And I know that your expertise is in Germany with the Ordo and the Freiburg School. But it was John Dewey who very early in the century was one of the first to really identify as a neoliberal, although he didn't use that term. In his little volume, Liberalism and Social Action, he basically said, here's the old liberalism. And what I am is a new liberal. Let's talk about the new liberalism. And that new liberalism became kind of the New Deal liberalism, which I think could also be identified as center left. That's all I've got. OK, so thank you so much. Um, this was indeed quite helpful. And of course, the question of what classical liberalism is as opposed to libertarianism opens the question about libertarians and then the subdomains, right? So do we have uncaps? Do we have 
minarchist, what is not a minarchist, but a classical liberal, right? So we have this conceptual mess to which I might have contributed tonight. Um, um, I understand that. Um, uh, and again, uh, that would already quite that would that would already be a progress. Um, what all I said uh, was an attempt to make uh, liberalism a more attractive motion, right? So um, um, none of it was. Um, let me put it like that. Um, oh, okay, let's forget that. Um, now, I fully agree about Dewey in the US, and certainly you have the new liberals in England around 1900, so totally agree. Center left, center right. Now, the problem is, of course, that that differs across countries and time, right? So, what is center left? Even if you take the US in 1960s and today, the center shifts, and by that also, the positioning of, of different parties and different motions also shifts, right? So um, my attempt was to say, we have these perennial reformulations. I zoom into one of them and perhaps we can learn from them. I agree in a certain sense, and this will also be my reply to John once he's back, that what I said might be a center left formulation, but again, in Germany, it's actually center right. Right, so because then the social, social democracy would actually be not very sympathetic to many of the things which I said, right? So uh, if you emphasize, uh, let's say, a hard currency or something like that, people would be like, oh. mm -hmm. so it really, really, really depends on uh, on the context. And um, those ideas in Germany after the war started out as being, uh, even the, the center right had to, it took quite a while until the center right, so the Christian Democrats subscribed to them. Then they did, and then basically everybody did, but um, in some nuances and in some portions in the course of time. So um, I agree with you that center left, center right help, but only if we fix time and space, let's say, and say, well, the US for the past 20 years, then we can pinpoint. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, we have a final question by Michael. Yeah, thank you very much. Again, really, really enjoyed the talk and got me thinking about a variety of things. I want I want to first applaud the notion that um, these labels and particularly the policies that people putting ver assigning various labels to themselves and to others does have to be uh, in context of something. And obviously, we've had big growth of the welfare state in lots of places, et cetera. We're not going to go back to uh, you know, 18th, early 18th century or early 19th century. Um, and it was summarized by a, a great comment by, uh, I call this politics, political economy, or just common sense, by Bill Buckley, who said, Republicans should nominate the most conservative candidate that can win. <laughs> and so there's kind of a constraint if you want to get something done. Um, I want to just raise kind of something about who gets to make the rules and what the rules are, uh, which I think is very important. You mentioned it briefly. Uh, we've spent time on uh, more or less other things since then. But um, the founding fathers in America were really uh, quite heavily emphasized by Locke and others. Um, and they, when, when the Constitution was written, John Adams famously said, when asked, what have you given us? And they, he said, a nation of laws, not of men. And so first of all, that you want a rules-based society was kind of deeply embedded. Uh, and that there was a constitution that laid out a framework. Of course, it's been interpreted differently and et cetera, et cetera. Now people want to pack the Supreme Court to change the rules. Um, that's number one. But also there's, a, there's another strain that, um, I think it's not easily characterized, which is a Swedish school of Newt Vixell and Eric Lindahl. And, um, and what I find important about that is that Vixell laid down the strongest intellectual case for supermajorities. In fact, qualified unanimity was, uh, but supermajorities. And that seems to have been lost from the discussion in, uh, in large parts of the world. And um, I'm wondering if that's something that it makes sense to rekindle. 
Um, thank you for that. So um, the Buckley quote is wonderful. Um, I agree. With, let me put it like that. Um, the whole notion which I try to emphasize, and that's why it resonates with classical with uh, with constitutional political economy as as produced by Jim Buchanan, is that the whole attempt of that generation is really to to put uh, to have something like a constitutionalism for the economic order. Now it's of course, as you say, a non-trivial question: who is the one who sets the rules? In a country like the US, which has been stable uh, over the past, uh, stable entity over the past uh, couple of hundred years, it's quite clear. In a country like Germany, 1945, it's the, less, the least clear case imaginable, right? So will there be a state again? Will that state be independent? So, uh, and I find it even more interesting that they were bold enough to think about constitutionalizing an economy in a country which didn't exist. Uh, and in a continent which uh, people would not imagine uh, could be anything of uh, a political, of a, let's say, a political entity which could talk about uh, rules as they started in the 1950s. So, if we apply your question to Europe, it was an attempt to to have a federal country which is decentralized, but then is embedded in a larger. European Union and the question which started in the 1950s was similar to the federalism debate of the, of the US in the past 200 uh, years is which rules do we put where, who is in charge of what. So in a certain sense, Europe is emulating that, whether it's emulating it well or not uh, is of course a different question. So, um, and yes, well, in terms of supermajority in itself, again, coming from the canon, um, I believe that if you think of this ironic formula as the attempt to find either consensus or at least a workable compromise on a certain topic could be understood as something like the Buchananite Vixelian strive for uh, not having a 51 versus 49, but it, indeed uh, an attempt uh, to go towards unanimity, at least in the long run. So it is comparable to this ironic formula of finding compromises or ideally consensus. Yeah, I think so there's also a sense of stability that something that you have a broad consensus in, way more than simple majority rule, which has been screwing up the US till the last mm -hmm. couple of administrations. Um, uh, is, you, the policies are much more likely to endure, and especially when you tie those to the assignment of the costs of implementing them. Um, the taxes are however. Anyway, um, just thank you, Sassy. I apologize. I have, to, I have to be at a noon meeting on another side of campus, so I've got to run. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stefan, and thank you, everyone. Next week, we'll have Bruce Reed Gilly from Portland State University. He will talk about pay equity policies. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.